Hey, Ballard Church, welcome to another week of Ballard Church Online. I'm so glad you took a little bit of your time uh, this week when you could have so many other things to do and invest in what a relationship with God could look like, maybe for the first time, uh, but for many of us, just continuing to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus. If this is your first time with us, I'm so glad you took the time. My name is Lance. I'm the pastor here, and we're in the conversation where uh, we've titled Misquoted. Misquoted, because we've all heard people say things like, well, The Bible says, and what follows can be dangerous, it can be concerning, it can be troubling, it can be downright scary and confusing. And for many of our faith, we've been challenged or curious or frustrated by things that we've heard people say, well, the Bible says. And uh, as we've talked about before, some of this is done in good intention, some of it is done maliciously, but it gets us to some really weird places, even if they sound good, even if it's things that we wish were in the Bible. Last week, uh, we talked about the idea that the Bible says, go and do what makes you happy. I wish that was in the Bible, but unfortunately, it's not. And today's can seem similar. Today's is simply this, well, the Bible says, forgive and forget like God does for us. Forgive and forget like God does for for us, and I've, I've seen this used in two ways. The first is the people who try and meet someone in a hard moment or something that's hard to rationalize or they've just gone through something significant and, and in a way to try and encourage and help you move forward, they simply say, well, you know, God forgives you. Maybe you can forgive them and just forget about it. We can move forward and dismiss it. You just bury it down and, and forget about it and maybe deal with it another day. And And sometimes, unfortunately, I've seen this weaponized in the church where people would say, if you're struggling with something, you know what? You need to forgive and forget. You should be doing this. God has forgiven you, and he's forgotten about your sin, so you should just move on. And one thing we say around here is it gets really messy when you should on people. You just end up with should everywhere. And uh, we, we try not to do that. And unfortunately, or fortunately for some, this isn't in the Bible. It's a compelling idea. It's something that would look snappy on Instagram. I totally get that, but unfortunately it's not something that we actually see in the Bible. Jesus talks a ton about forgiveness. That is in the Bible, and today I want to unpack a little bit more about what forgiveness could look like for each of us. And uh, we're going to start right away. We're going to jump right in. In Matthew 18, uh, we see Peter come to Jesus with this concept of forgiveness to really pencil out, okay, how do we do this practically? Because the message would be short and the message would be easy if I just said, okay, go and forgive everyone. And you'd be like, okay, sure. And, and honestly, it's probably advice you knew was coming. You probably knew that that was an option at the table, but practically What does it look like? And so you've probably asked a question of God or maybe a question of others exactly like Peter does of Jesus. Here's what we see Peter asks. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? I mean, come on. I mean, seven times am I going to forgive them? I mean, where's the limit and the threshold where we say, no more forgiveness, you're cut off. Like the, like the soup Nazi in Seinfeld, you are just cut off, you're out of here, you're done. And some of you got that reference, and if you didn't, I mean, it's okay, God's still working in your life too. But, but here's what happens is, is Peter gets to the place where I think a lot of us are, uh, where we say, how many times do I have to forgive this person? How many times do we have to let this cycle continue to happen? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And, and Peter, I mean, stunned, confused, is essentially Jesus' way of saying, you just need to keep forgiving. Because Peter has this, this concept, I think that a lot of us have, this, this assumption uh, when it comes to forgiveness that when I'm forgiving somebody, I'm just simply being the good guy. And here's the assumption that I think a lot of us really have when it comes to us, uh, is that forgiveness is for the benefit of the offender. Like, if I'm forgiving somebody, I'm just putting on the good guy, super Christian, I'm a great guy hat, and I'm doing it for your benefit. Like, aren't you lucky to have a friend who is so godly and so holy and so perfect like me that I will continue to extend forgiveness? But at some point, come on, we all have to take the hat off. We all have to quit being the good guy. Because at the end of the day, when we've been offended, we know this, that there's a debt that's been created. 
that, that you owe me something. That's why we use the phrase, you owe me an apology. That you owe me something in the middle of something that's been, that's been said. Maybe it's your boss who owes you recognition. Maybe it's a spouse who owes you something. Maybe it's your kids. Whoever it may be, a friend. Regardless, we all know what it's like to have this moment where we say, okay, all of a sudden, either I could forgive you, but, but really I think you owe me something in return. And uh, we've all been there. Come on, if you've been married, if you tried to be married, if you have friends, if you've had roommates, if you had all this moment, you know this tension of what it's like. And you also know that this reality is true. Simply saying I'm sorry doesn't solve it. Maybe I just saved somebody's marriage or their college roommates or whatever, but, but here's what we know. Come on, we know this is true, that somebody's just saying I'm sorry isn't, isn't clear enough. When you're working with kids and you tell a kid, hey, remember, you need to go say, I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of times we'll work and try and direct them to say, I'm sorry, and for what reason? Because we know that apologies have to be specific, that, that when something is done to us intentionally, that forgiveness and, and apologies really have to, have to lean to the specific, that generalizing doesn't help. And uh, when we get to it, when, when this doesn't happen for us, we start to build our case, right? We start to build our case on why we're offended, and a lot of us sit on it. Some of you, you're pretty straightforward, and you're direct, and you demand an apology, and that can go sideways sometimes too. But I think for a lot of us, we get to a place where we try to work through what it could be like uh, to seek forgiveness. And we start to build a case, and we, we play this mental dialogue, and we start to we start to say, okay, if they are going to apologize, here's what it should look like or could look like, and we continue to escalate. And we really hope that this moment where they finally do apologize is very public, if we're really honest, the nasty part. I hope you come to me, and there's everybody around, and, and they can look at you and say, you're gross, and they can look at me and say, I can't believe you forgave them. You're such a hero. You're such a good person. And we start to play out this narrative of what it could look like to forgive. And uh, unfortunately, I think especially when it comes to our faith, again, the toxic side of our faith can come in and, and we can misconstrue forgiveness into you just need to move forward. You just need to get past it. You just need to get over it and move forward and listen. Here's, here's the reality. If I knew your story, if you had a chance to come up and tell me if you had a chance to get in front of the church, get in front of enough people, and you could tell your side of the story and tell why you were wronged and explain what happened, I don't know if I'd be so quick. I think you could tell me your story in a way where I would side with you, where I would say, yeah, maybe you don't need to forgive. That maybe the thing that they did to you or the thing that you experienced, like, man, that is gross. And honestly, if you told me your story, I would probably end up siding with you. I'd say, yeah, let's grab pitchforks. Let's, let's take them down. Let's go slash their tires. This is messed up. Let's go full Taylor Swift, Carrie Underwood revenge song on this person. Like, this is what we need to do in order to get back at them. And, and at the very least, I would side with you enough that when they walked into a room, I would glare at them like, yeah. I know what you're about. I know what you did. I know what you're sa- I, don't, I know what you've said. Like I would team up with you. But when it comes to forgiveness and being offended and the things that have happened to us in our life and really moving forward, Jesus teaches us a whole new paradigm. In order to explain it well and explain it practically, he goes into a parable. He tells us a story that's fictional to really drive home a point. Some of the details seem so extreme, and I think when we see extreme details, we're revealed to extreme truths. And so I think for us, when we dive into the story that Jesus tells, a lot can come to the table. And whether right now a story or a person or an idea is coming to mind and you're tempted to click away because it's like, hey, come on. If you're trying to tell me by the end of this, I'm going to be ready to forgive, then I'm out of here because you just don't understand. I I challenge you, stick with us because I think we all have something to learn in this story. Here's what Jesus would teach us about forgiveness. Therefore, he tells this story, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began began the settlement, a man uh, who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. I mean, what? I mean, 10,000 bags of gold in, in our time is still absolutely incredible. Then it equates to about $10 million. I mean, just this unbelievable amount. How you got this far in debt, I have no idea, but this is what Jesus is talking about. $10 million was brought before him. Since he was not able to pay, understandably, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he owned or that all he had be sold to repay 
the debt. And unfortunately, this is the strange time in history that they lived in that you didn't get to declare bankruptcy. You didn't get to go, hey, I'm so sorry, I can't make the payment this time. Uh, in order to repay debts, everything was on the table. Not only your property, your holdings, your possessions, but your family. And so he's forced in, the, in this moment to really rectify, the servant is, with, with what he's put his family in. That he thought it would turn out okay, but he got himself over his head, and as a result, his whole family would be sold into indentured servitude until he could pay it back. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. To which the crowd Jesus is telling this story to probably laughed out loud. They probably thought to themselves, okay, sure, you're going to pay back the, 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 all this $10 million. You're going to pay back bags of gold. And, that, and that, would t- that would be generational wealth. There's no way to get back to this place. And And this is amazing what happens next. The servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt and let him go. Wait, so (laughs) I expected like a Shark Tank negotiation to happen. Like you wanted all these bags of gold. How about we just settle at four bags of gold? And I thought they would go back and forth and back and forth. But in this miracle upon miracle, on this absolutely extreme occasion, the master said, you know what? seeing the position that you're in, I'm going to forgive the debt. I'm going to completely cancel it. You are forgiven. Move on with a whole new lease on life. To which the crowd is, sh- is shaken. They're amazed. This is absolutely incredible. Changed his life. But the story continues. And here's what we see. But the servant went out, the same guy who was forgiven, and he found one of his fellow servants who had owed him a hundred silver coins, equivalent to about a day's wage. I mean, a day or two's wage, a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. This is escalating quickly. This is getting aggressive. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And the same feeling that's welling up inside of you welled up in front of the crowd. And Jesus had him exactly where he wanted him. This feeling of disgust and hypocrisy and how dare you. Come on, for a day's wage, you just got forgiven more than your family will ever own for generations. And instead, you look at a guy who owes you something for a day, who who you bought his sandwich yesterday for work. I mean, this this is a joke. And he choked him out and said, you owe me your money right now. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? Jesus is, is making sure that all of us, it doesn't matter how slow of a reader we are, we get the correlation. He used the exact same phrase that was used just a few verses before. The exact same phrase, very similar situation, way less at stake, and we'll see what happens next. This is, this is phenomenal. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. And this is, this is unbelievable. I mean, this is staggering. When the other servants saw this, what they had happened, they were outraged. I mean, you and I, we feel the same way. We were outraged. How can you do that? Come on, you were offered this spectacular, opulent forgiveness, and instead you, you look at somebody and say, you, you owe me and you have to pay me back. And what's so interesting, this is just a free tip. This is a free lesson. I just think this is so, so fascinating as a tangent here. But he threw him in prison until he could pay back the debt. He put him in a place where he could no longer earn income and expected him to pay back the debt. And if you're really honest with yourself just for a moment, maybe you're expecting the same thing from somebody else. That you've put them in a place where they can no longer have a relationship with you. You don't even talk to them. You don't even have a means for them to get back into your good graces. But your expectation remains the same that they pay it back. That somehow, until they dance through these magical hoops that you haven't even defined and and meet these terms and do these things that you've built up over time because you've fostered fostered something which is probably understandable and justifiable. Remember, if you explained it, I would probably agree with you. But but you've gotten to a place where they don't even have the opportunity to pay you back. Jesus understands this tension, and he he begins to build it up. So the other servants, they're outraged. They go back to the high master— And they said this to him. Then the master called his servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all your debt, uh, uh, all of yours, because you begged me to. Shouldn't have you had the same mercy for your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? In anger, his master uh, handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Amazing. And at this point in the story, 
I think Peter, who was standing there and originally prompted this conversation with Jesus, is starting to understand that maybe he was on the wrong side of things. He was starting to understand that, like, maybe, hold on, aren't you telling me that, that in these moments where I'm the victim, where I'm the one who's been wronged, where I'm the one who's been offended, isn't this the moment where God sees my pain, he teams up with me, and we go get him together? Don't we see, like, this King David taking the heads of his enemies? Like, all, don't we see this all over the Old Testament, that God is just, and, and I deserve it, and when I've been wronged, God's on my team, and we go get everybody? Like, isn't this how it plays out? And Jesus begins to paint this picture that looks incredibly different. He begins to paint a picture of a kingdom of God. He begins to paint a picture of the New Testament, of his gospel, of of something brand new, of good news that changes the dynamics between individuals. And here's why we see this end. This, this example, this is exactly how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. This is the exact way God will teach you unless you forgive. In this moment, come on, this is one of the things that I wish wasn't in the Bible. This is one of the things that are just so difficult. And a lot of us read this and we think, okay, like maybe that's good, but the the big issue that we get kind of weird here is that that at some point now God has kind of forced or threatened me into the fact that I need to forgive people. And if I don't, then it kind of gives me this ultimatum that either I forgive people or I'm doomed. I forgive people or I have no shot. Either you get over it or you don't. And we start to, we start to, see this callous language and we go to ourselves, ah, it just doesn't feel right. It feels so blunt and it feels so quick. And here's the thing, I don't have the levity to say something like that. I don't understand everything that happened in your life. I don't get it. I, it would be hard for me to say, you just need to move on. But the craziest thing is that God knows your pain. He knows what happened. He saw it. He understands it more than anybody else could and still invites you to forgive. He still challenges you to forgive. And why is this? Why does God put us in this situation? And here's why. Because I think God knew that we were never meant to handle an unforgiving spirit. We weren't meant to handle it. We weren't wired for it. We're not prepared for it. That our body cannot handle an unforgiving spirit. The anger, the bitterness, and the resentment that occurs is like hitting a self-destruct button. When we start to hold on to a lack of forgiveness, when we hold on to this pain so tightly, God knows that we essentially bury a bomb inside that is ready to detonate at any moment. We, we, we begin to really self-destruct from the inside in a way that's hard for us to understand and comprehend. But the good news is that God knows how we're wired and what we need. I like to think of it this way. Uh, my daughter, Winter, loves M&M's. We've trained her to love M&M's. It's like Pavlov. She does something good. We gave her two M&M's. That's great. But it's only like <clears throat> when, we, when she does something really, really good, we give her two M&M's. That's it. Usually we give her one M&M. One M&M is great. Two M&M's means like you've just saved the world. The house is on fire and you put your baby sister on your shoulders and ran her out of the house. Like then you get two M&M's. That's it. Like those, this has to be like big, big, big moments. And the other day, we came home, and our sitter, we had this big bag of M&Ms uh, up in a tall drawer, and Winter never gets to see the bag. She just gets to see two M&Ms, right? And the other day, I see her sitter. She came in. She grabbed the bag off the top shelf. She set it on the ground next to Winter and opened it up. And in that moment, Winter saw a glimpse of heaven. She didn't realize that M&Ms came in that quantity. She didn't realize that it was an option to see the greatest treat in her life in like a 10,000 pack. She didn't understand what to do. Her little tiny two-year-old mind exploded. And she just, she's like, wait, this is an option? Unbelievable. And she begins to dive in. And wouldn't you know it, the dad that I am, I pick the bag up off the ground. I give her two M&Ms and I put it back on the top shelf. And she's like, why would you deny me the greatest thing in my life? This is the greatest moment that's ever happened. You buy me toys, you get me clothes, you put a roof over my head. Don't care about any of that. There's a thing called a bag of M&Ms. This is absolutely flabbergasting. But you want to know what I know as a dad? That she doesn't know how to find her limits. That she would just eat the whole bag of M&Ms, then she'd puke everywhere, and it would be gross, and she wouldn't feel good, and it would be disgusting. And you and I both know a bag of M&Ms is not a good idea for a two-year-old. 
And it sounds silly and it might seem quick or trite, but, but here's the thing. God knows that, that holding resentment, that holding bitterness, that fostering anger is not good for us. And that in some moments it has to be taken away. And even though for some of you this bitterness might be a security blanket, even though this anger might be the only thing that holds you together, realizing that someday they're going to get theirs, and if they don't, I don't know what I would do if they didn't get justice. Holding on to that has been the only thing that's kept you secure, and God would invite you to something so much better, so much deeper, because he doesn't want to see you go down this road of self-destruction. The area that I saw this the most was probably youth ministry, where I would, uh, we'd have new teenagers come into our youth ministry all the time, and they would, some of them would just come in angry, just angry, and it wasn't me. I mean, they don't even know me, so I don't know, <laughs> they're not angry with me, but they would just come in angry at the world. I mean, scowl like they sucked on a bag of lemons. They're just like bitter at everything. They're quick. They're short with people. They're just, they're just, they're just really aggressive and and we always knew what the case would be. It's not bitter at me. They're not necessarily bitter at their teachers. Maybe there would be something happening at home. And it's usually something that they would be holding against mom or dad. And, and there would be this frustrating moment. And some of them are very valid. And the situations that we heard for, from different families were just heartbreaking sometimes to think of what was happening in certain people's home life. And it was just you felt for them and you understood and, and ultimately got to a place where it's like, man, you're kind of justified and your anger, and your frustration, but what we ultimately saw play out is, is out of their resentment and frustration, they'd hit the self-destruct button, and they think, if I can just tear my life apart enough that it would hurt my parents in a way, or, man, if I could just be bitter enough for the world that the world would somehow figure itself out. And now you look back, and you see it, and it breaks your heart, but unfortunately, it's so much harder to see when it's happening to you I sit with couples who are frustrated and angry and sitting in different counseling environments where you're trying to, we're trying to help a couple find healing. And, you know, you do a little bit digging and they're both so mad, but after a while you dig for a bit and you start to realize they're not even mad at each other, that they've been mad at somebody else and the only person that's close enough in proximity to let this anger out on is their spouse. And so they're getting the blunt of the lack of forgiveness that's happened in a different area of their life or maybe their family or their kids or getting the blunt. Why? Just because they're close enough. Just because they're the person with the easiest access to let out this frustration and let out this anger. And in the moment where Jesus says, you need to lead with forgiveness, I think our assumption was maybe wrong. That it's not as much about what it means for others, but what God can do in our own heart as we start to clean things out, clear things up, and let go and begin to move through with what forgiveness could look like. And here's what happens when we, feel, when we feel general frustration, we start to forgive generally. I mean, we know this is true. If we feel generally, then we'll forgive generally. If I'm just mad at you, then I'll just like forgive I'm mad, or I'm, I'll forgive out of my anger. But Jesus uses this illustration of a debt, I think, so specifically for a reason. I think he labeled a specific debt because when we're specific with what we can forgive, everything changes. We can be specific with what we feel like we're owed. Because when, when I just forgive you generally, there's still things that creep up. It's like leaving some weeds in the ground. They're just going to grow again next year. you got to get the root. You have to understand what you feel like you're owed, what you feel like was betrayed, what you feel like was hurt. And you begin to name that and forgive it specifically. Here's what, here's what I believe to be true, is effective forgiveness is specific forgiveness. If you want effective forgiveness that's going to begin to, to clear out the anger and bitterness and frustration in your own heart, I'm not worried about their behavior modification right now. I'm not worried about that. Come on, you can't worry about that. You're in control of your own heart. And when, if you really want to eff effectively forgive, it needs to be specific. It needs to be clear because Jesus painted the same idea of what it means to forgive specifically. I thought this was an absolutely incredible quote that can maybe start to change the perspective you have on forgiveness. Holding a grudge doesn't make you strong. It makes you bitter. Forgiving doesn't make you weak. It sets you free. There's an opportunity for us to not be bitter, to not feel like, man, I'm so strong because I've been able to endure my anger for so long. I've been able to hold this grudge even when I should have moved on, I could have moved on, even though time is supposed to heal all wounds. I've been able to hold on to it, and I've been able to focus it in a way. Come on, but there's a way that sets you free. It's through forgiveness.
Now, we have to backpedal all the way to the very beginning statement that we made. You should forgive and forget the same way God did for you. And now I think forgiveness is pivotal. But the forget part is where I start to have some trouble. Because here's the reality, and this is maybe a troubling truth for you, and and maybe this could help clarify the way that God looks at you, is, is when God forgives you, he doesn't forget your sin. And you might think, how is that possible? Aren't they, aren't they kind of the same thing? When I forgive somebody, I forget everything. And it's just not how it works. There's something actually even better that God offers to the table, and this is it. The amazing thing about God is that he knows your sin and still loves you. The amazing thing about God, come on, here's what we know to be true. If forgetting was an option, it's a way better option. In fact, if forgetting was an option, we wouldn't even need forgiveness. We just forget it. We just forget it, and it would no longer be on the table. It wouldn't be something we worry about. It would have been forgotten. And so what's the need for forgiveness? It doesn't predicate the other. One excludes the other. Simply forgetting about something doesn't require forgiveness anymore, but God says it's even better than that, that in light of who you are and what you did and who I am and how perfect I am, I choose to love you anyway. I chose to send my son regardless. And it doesn't matter what happens next or what happens in the future, that God has to keep taking amnesia pills each time we mess up, that it's like, oh my gosh, I'm blindsided every time this happened because I had no idea what was happening. Come on, God is all-knowing and in light of what he knows about you. He loves you anyway, and he extends consistent forgiveness. And maybe we can take a clue of what that looks like to begin to move forward in our own lives. I'll give you one more illustration really quick. When I was in college, uh, I went to this ill-advised, really late at night uh, Mexican food joint, and I had a burrito that was questionable at best, but it was E&I's college. You got an iron stomach, it's 2 a.m., what could go wrong? So I smashed this burrito, and it's the last week of school. I'm finishing up finals, really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, just trying to have a good time. And, and uh, I don't want to name the place because I don't want to, like, throw a big grudge at it, but it was, it, was, it was sketchy. And it was right over by UW, and I'll let you fill in the gaps from there. But I remember the next day I woke up with the worst food poisoning. Surprise, surprise, right? The worst food poisoning ever. I mean, it was <clears throat> for days. I was laid up on the couch. It was awful. I felt, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty wussy sick person anyway, but this is like, it was bad. I'm trying to like take Gator, I'm trying to get Gatorade in my system. I'm trying to get anything to just keep myself hydrated. It was, it just wrecked me. Now a poor response to that would be to forget it ever happened. It's a poor coping mechanism. To say that I'm just going to forget it doesn't work. But to also at the same time say I'm never going to forgive food again. In fact, I'm going to take it to such an extreme, I'm never eating Mexican food again. Not just there, I'm never eating it, period. In fact, I'm never eating food that I can't prepare myself. It's gotten that extreme. I mean, neither are good coping options. But what I think is a good way to move forward is in light of what I've experienced, starting to change my behavior. And it, and it begins to change everything. And here's maybe one tip or idea, and this could be a whole message in itself, but here's one idea on this tension of forgetting and forgiveness that I think can really change everything. Walls are created through bitterness. Walls are created when we don't forgive. Walls are created where you don't have access and you never will, and this is broken relationship and you're never getting in. And walls are created not only in our own hearts, but in the hearts of others. Boundaries are created through forgiveness and wisdom. Wisdom happens through experience. And what's amazing is this idea that God doesn't invite us to set up walls around our hearts so we never have any experience again. And if I just never talk to anyone, I'll never hurt the same way again. If I never love again, then I'll never have my heart broken. Walls begin to get set up. That's not what God invites us to, but he does invite us to boundaries, to clearly defining expectations. That in light of what I've been through and the last time that we engaged in this way, I've forgiven you and we've moved forward. But I still can't, doesn't mean we can interact the same way. Doesn't mean that we can have the same relationship as we once did. We know boundaries are a good idea. At least we do for everybody else. When that person comes to you and said, I want to start dating them, and you say, that's a bad idea. Why? Because you need to have some boundaries. They don't, it doesn't feel like a right time to do it. I mean, it's easy for us to identify boundaries in other people's lives, but it can get so unclear in our own. When we forgive, but don't forget, it gives us an opportunity to set healthy boundaries and move forward in a really healthy way. So, here's the last phrase I'm going to leave you with, 
And I'm going to challenge you with something, because at the very end, I want to pray for two groups of people that I believe are watching. And you might be in both camps, but my guess is that you're in one or the other. Here's, here's what I think. Uh, this is a really good phrase for us to understand better than forgive and forget. In order to forgive, I can't forget what Jesus did on the cross. In order to forgive, I can't forget what Jesus did on the cross. When Jesus extended forgiveness in light of everything that's happened in my life, when he doesn't forget about my sin, but instead loves me anyway, I can't forget that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice as an attempt to regain and restore relationship. And if we're really honest, this could hurt some feelings, but I'm just going to say it. Jesus isn't asking you to die for a group of people, to forgive them, just to extend forgiveness. Maybe it's through a phrase. Maybe it's through vocalizing it. Maybe it's through writing a letter. I don't know what it means for you, but Jesus is inviting you to the opportunity to begin the process of forgiveness. And when we do this, everything could change. In fact, when we do this, when we start to understand that Jesus gave his life for us, that Jesus made the first move on our behalf, maybe we start to realize that we're not always in the right. That even though we would love to claim authority over the position of victim, over the position of the person who's been wronged, of the person who deserves to be angry and deserves to be bitter, Jesus would look at us and say, I've extended forgiveness first. And we start, when we realize that, we start to, to lift our eyes above our own frustrations and realize where we might be on the offending side of someone else's pain. We start to realize where we might need to extend forgiveness. We start to realize once we open our hands and forgive others, where we need to seek forgiveness as well. We need to say more than I'm sorry, but put words to it and strategy to it and authenticity behind it and empathy into it to validate people's pain. And we can't do that. We can't meet people in their pain until we start to release some of ours. So there's two groups of people I want to pray for as we close. The first group is the group that would t- say, today, Lance, honestly, it's not going to be easy. And it probably won't happen in a moment, but I know forgiveness needs to happen in my own heart. That I need to let something go. That it's been, it's been tearing me apart and I've been self-distracting ever since, but I need to forgive. And even though the relationship may never look the same, I know it can change my heart. The other group of people that are here today, that say, I need to quit looking for a reason to be offended. I need to be reminded of what God did for me so I can seek forgiveness from others that I can seek reconciliation in grace. I don't know which camp you're in, but I'd love to pray for you either way. So would you do me a favor? Would you, would you simply set things aside wherever you're watching from? Bow your head, close your eyes. I think it just gives us a little bit of, of solitude and, and pause in a busy world like we live in. And would you just join me in a prayer? Jesus, for those of us that know that we need to forgive, today would you give us the strength and the courage We know that you understand more than anybody else exactly what happened. You understand the details. You know the significance. You know the pain and the hurt and the gravity and the of all of it. You know how big it was, God. But you invite us to forgive out of your, your strength. So today, maybe we lean on the strength of your Holy Spirit to give us courage to forgive, to begin to let go. And Jesus, as we just maybe even physically open our hands in this moment to let go of something, would you start to bring a release? Would you start to bring a freshness and a refreshing to our soul? God, would you remind us of what grace feels like, of what hope and clarity feels like? Would you remind us what what it's like to be free of bitterness and anger? Jesus, I pray for that freedom today. And God, for all of us, would you, would you give us the strength and clarity to know where we've hurt others? Where we maybe need to initiate the conversation of apologizing? Where we identify in a way that, that we've hurt somebody and, and God, that we owe them something. And today, would you help us ease into that process? If not only to bring wholeness to ourselves, but God, to offer that person a sense of wholeness and fulfillment. Jesus, give us the strength on either side. We know that if we don't forgive, it, we're, 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 we're holding on to something that we never needed to. So today, give us the strength and give us the wisdom. In your name, amen and amen.
Well, I absolutely loved this conversation, and I want to issue a challenge to you right now if you're watching online. Here's, here's a few things that are coming up uh, in the life of Ballard Church. Is, is I would always challenge people to be taking a next step. Whether you've been watching for a while or this is something that's brand new to you, I believe every person has a next step in their faith. And so I don't know what that could look like for you, but I would challenge you to check out our website. Right up at the top, you'll see a list, a tab full of next step options. On May 16th, here in just a few weeks of when we recorded this, uh, you're going to have the option to maybe get baptized. Maybe that's a next step for you as, as you've engaged in a relationship with Jesus and you've never taken the step to publicly declare your faith. It's a command of Jesus, and I would recommend it. It could be one of the greatest days of your life. We also have child dedications coming up on Mother's Day, and we have a lot of fun things planned for moms. So regardless of what a next step looks like for you, I would challenge you to investigate it more. Maybe get in a group, maybe see what God has in store for you. But for now, have an absolutely incredible week. God bless you, and we'll see you right back here at Ballard Church Online.